Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. We are about to get going for this annual general meeting. So in a moment or two's time, uh, I'll come back to you. So for about a moment, your time is your own, and uh, I'll be back with you just after that. Thanks very much for coming. Well, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be in the world, everyone, and welcome in very unusual circumstances to this, the 145th Annual General Meeting of the Chartered Banker Institute. Uh, I'm Bill McCall, President of the Institute, and it strikes me that like many organisations, certainly in the UK and other parts of the world, we can't meet in person and enjoy each other's company, as well as conducting the formal business of our meeting. Uh, meeting virtually, though, also has its benefits. In our case, uh, being more easy to welcome an increasing number of our members from around the world. So to all of you, it's a pleasure to have you here, wherever you are dialing in and tuning in from today. A couple of housekeeping notes before we begin our formal business. Firstly, the agenda for this evening's meeting was published online in accordance with our Royal Charter and rules. And we have also added a copy of the agenda to the files you can view through the Bright Talk page we are using to host the meeting. Secondly, we traditionally conduct any votes that may be required during our meeting with a show of hands. Now, obviously, that presents some challenges and won't work this evening. So instead, by the wonders of modern science, you can vote using the relevant section and buttons on the Bright Talk channel on the right-hand side of your screen. I should warn you, there can be a short delay between starting a voting poll and this, this then going live for voting, given that we've got so many people in different places. So we will pause for possibly up to a minute uh, when we ask you to vote before you get the opportunity to press the button. So there will be a, a delay of silence, and I promise not to sing opera or to try any comedy. And thirdly, if you want to ask a question, please use the chat function on Bright Talk to do so, and my colleagues and I will do our very best to answer. Finally, before we get going, I can confirm that we are correct, and our annual general meeting may proceed. So turning to our agenda, the minutes of the 144th annual general meeting of last year I propose that the minutes of that annual general meeting, as posted online on the Chartered Banker website, be taken as read. Board members, fellows, and members of the Chartered Banker Institute, welcome to this, our 145th annual general meeting of the Chartered Banker Institute. As I said in my opening remarks at last year's annual general meeting, choppy waters in our economy were overdue and a correction of sorts in financial markets too. Uh, but as we meet virtually this evening, 
at a time of this coronavirus crisis, I take little solace in being right with my prediction. And in truth, I feel dreadful about it. There is little consolation in being right when the outcome is so threatening and many of us will face and have already faced considerable challenges and change due to the impact of this awful pandemic. That said, our institute is here to support our members and more importantly, our clients, customers and communities too. And being professionally qualified and adhering to our standards is a differentiator for clients and customers, evidenced by views and opinions gathered. As a leading professional body, we have been providing support and guidance to our members during these difficult and unprecedented times. We are maintaining an oversight of the knowledge and skills needed to help to navigate the current climate, sharing resources, webcasts, and an extensive range of thought leadership with our members, and indeed the wider banking community. Our institute was one of the first to move away from traditional exam diets, where large numbers of candidates gather in a room on a set date at a set time, and we did so more than a decade ago. At the beginning of the year, we introduced a remote invigilation service allowing candidates to choose a date, time, and location that suits them. Now, we didn't foresee the lockdowns around the world, but our early fortuitous adoption of remote invigilation meant we have been able to continue to deliver our exams with little disruption. Now, dealing with disruptive forces and supporting our members, customers, and communities in difficult times isn't new for our institute. And as I wrote in my foreword to this year's annual report, this institute of ours, the oldest banking institute in the world, has, in its near one and a half centuries of existence, faced wars, rationing, epidemics, and more than a few financial shocks. The global impact of the coronavirus outbreak has prompted me to look back over some of the institute's historical archives to see how our members and students coped during previous momentous and challenging times. I try to be a keen student of history, and I believe in learning from the lessons of the past and to apply those lessons to shape our future. So a century ago, our predecessors on the Institute's then Council and our members held their annual general meeting in the shadow of the so-called Spanish flu pandemic, although certainly not originating in Spain. Surprisingly, there are very few direct references in reports from that time, and perhaps the memory, the painful memory of that great war, 1914 to 18, put the flu into perspective. The main concern, and it may be humorous for you to consider, that our council and members at the time were considering perhaps related to the pandemic and falls in economic production, was the shortage of and the high cost of paper, which was impacting on the production of our learning materials and our institute magazine. They were also worried, because they were extremely prudent men and women, by the institute's high, high historically high overdraft, which stood at 200 and £45. Pounds. It was resolved that the banks would be asked to subscribe more substantial sums in the coming year to reduce this. So paper and an overdraft of £245. Pounds. There are also references in our records from 1920 to a very depressed state of the UK stock market and to a dismal trade outlook. In December of that year of 1920, we reported, and I quote, it is a long time since shares have been so depressed as they are at present. Only a year ago, people bought everything regardless of merit. Now the best shares are being thrown away with equal abandon, end quote. As a former member of the London Stock Exchange, I can see very little has changed. The Great War itself placed pressure on the banks and on our institute, much greater than those 
we face today. For students whose studies were interrupted by military service, we made arrangements for study via correspondence, the forerunner of today's online learning and remote invigilation. And as a mostly male bank staff joined up for the war effort, women joined the ranks of bank clerks, and for the first time they were allowed to sit for examination and become members of the Institute, which raises more eyebrows when looking at this through a contemporary lens. And I'm so glad they did make those changes. Now, during the Second War, study via correspondence continued, and we even made arrangements through the Red Cross for our members in prisoner of war camps to take their examinations. Now, no record remains as to whether guards were co-opted to make sure there was no cheating or whether they were invigilators. But today, of course, we can deliver examinations to those self-isolating at home somewhat more comfortably. So you can see that we have faced challenges times before and no doubt will do again. And despite very real threats and impacts of COVID-19, I do take comfort in looking back at our records to see how we successfully supported our past members and students in very challenging times. I assert these are not the unprecedented times that some claim we have been here before, it's just that you and I were not around. And we will help our current members and students enhance their knowledge and skills to help rebuild lives. Businesses will be restructured and communities will be damaged by the virus, just as our predecessors rebuilt their worlds in the shade of the 1918 pandemic and two world wars. Now, speaking of service, uh, I would like to take this opportunity in a year when we have rightly in the UK and the Commonwealth and the Allies, we've paid tribute to all the men and women who so bravely served our country during that second war. And I'd like to pay a tribute to our own real life hero, who also happens to be a fellow of our institute. Flight Lieutenant John A. Cruikshank, Victoria Cross. Joan is a remarkable man, uh, a hero and role model whose story should be more widely known, especially amongst our members. Flight Lieutenant Cruikshank was a young banker before signing up as soon as he could at the outbreak of World War II. Now, his personal story in winning his Victoria Cross is remarkable, yet was only one day in his long life although it must have felt like a lifetime the day it was happening. When you read the story, you will understand. After all that, John returned to the banking profession and worked overseas until his retirement back to Aberdeen in Scotland, where he resides still. He is our oldest member of our Chartered Banker Institute, and a mere side issue, of course, to being the eldest living Victoria Cross holder in the world. Difficult times need heroes, and he is one to look to for sure. So to John Cruikshank, Victoria Cross, who recently celebrated his 100th birthday on the 20th of May, on behalf of the board and our 30,000 global members around the world, we send our warmest greetings. Now, through a near decade I've served on council and now the Board of Trustees, I've learned and observed our executive team and staff are some of the most dedicated and diligent people I have ever worked alongside, based on, I don't know, approaching 60 or so companies I've chaired and the many individuals I've worked with over a long period of time. So to that end, I'm honoured and proud to be president of our institute, more so an institute with a wide demographic and diversity reflecting our banking profession as it is, not as it was. There is more to be done, of course, and there will always be. In my address last June, which seems to have flown by in time terms, I highlighted three areas of focus during my time as president. And in spite of the pandemic, they remain highly relevant to our plan. And your board, executive team, staff, and supporting banks are trying to deliver with your help. Firstly, 
advancing our Royal Charter mission, ensuring the direction of travel that continues to educate and promote professionalism <coughs> excuse me, in our profession is key. So I'm delighted to see how our new Royal Charter has successfully modernized our Institute's governance. With June 2019, our old governing council structure was replaced by the new Board of Trustees. And importantly, a newly created membership forum was also established, which is a true reflection of the 30,000 members we collectively are in the UK and worldwide. Crucially, that forum is providing a pulse beat analysis from our members, and that helps shape our strategy and grow our membership impact and influence. And my particular thanks to everyone involved in that membership forum. Second, the international influence and collaboration we've been building through our partnerships with professional bodies in Australia, the Bahamas, Hong Kong, India, Ireland, Malaysia, Malta, New Zealand, and Pakistan, they have been a continued focus for the Institute. And despite all the pandemic difficulties, we have received some good news recently from Australia and Malaysia, where our strong partnership with Finzia and the AICB have been so fundamental in enhancing our international profile. We're now proud to have both students and professionally qualified members in 108 countries, a figure that is up from 87 countries last year across the globe, all of whom share a common commitment to the Chartered Banker Code of Professional Conduct and to our global family of members. And thirdly, we are still standing full square behind the development of green and sustainable finance, underscored by the recent launch of the United Nations principles of responsible banking and the work and leadership of the former governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, amongst others. Having launched the Green Finance Certificate, the world's first benchmark qualification for finance professionals, we recently updated it and relaunched it as the Certificate in Green and Sustainable Finance. We were one of the first organizations to endorse the principles for responsible banking and are promoting these to our members. And through our international networks, it will be so. We also led the formation of the Green Finance Education Charter to be launched virtually next week. And that charter is a significant commitment from chartered and professional bodies in the UK and internationally. Integrating green finance and sustainability into our core curriculums, new qualifications, and the continued professional development of their members. Now, I expect in due course, so-called green finance will be part of mainstream finance. And our institutes and the principles and values we stand for and promote will firmly be in that mainstream too. But I do have to ask, in the light of the current health and economic disruption, has the importance and urgency of enhancing sustainable banking and finance lessened? Well, certainly in the short term, in terms of most countries' immediate priorities, probably yes. In many countries, policy, regulation, central bank activities, and so on, are now quite rightly focused on the immediate health and economic recovery measures required until we have a vaccine or at least a successful mass testing regime. We will still be dealing with health and economic emergencies around the world and unprecedented in our lifetimes. But the impact of global warming on individuals, communities and our world will dwarf those of COVID-19, which is why tackling the climate emergency remains a priority for policymakers and regulators. From a financial standpoint, central bankers have become increasingly concerned about climate risk, and in recent years, especially the risks of rapid transition, stranded assets, and their impact on financial sustainability. Now, many of you will have recently caught a glimpse of what the world could look at if there was a significant impairment of stranded assets of fossil fuel reserves. This could prompt action from the financial institutions heavily exposed to high carbon assets 
and moves towards reducing fossil fuel exposures in portfolio. It is already underway. So I would argue sustainable finance remains most important, notwithstanding the immediate crisis we're facing. And it is a mainstreaming sustainable banking and finance is ever more urgent. Alongside the very significant commercial and investment opportunities for financial services it provides, there is an even more compelling moral case. Sustainable banking and finance is an opportunity for our banking profession to demonstrate our positive social purpose. We can and we must help rebuild lives and communities post-COVID-19. And we must also play a leading role in helping individuals, communities, countries, and overall our planet transition to a sustainable, more socially just, low carbon world. In the year ended, considerable efforts also went into updating and extending our qualification offering, and we relaunched our professional banker certificate, the PBC, the Institute's flagship introductory banking certificate. Our new PBC supports the emerging needs of banks and bankers in the digital era, which is alive and well and with us and growing exponentially. We also expanded our qualification offering by launching the Chartered Banker by Experience program for experienced banking professionals as a flexible, accelerated, yet rigorous route to the highly sought after Chartered Banker status, all of which are available online, of course. I'm especially delighted to see a growing number of experienced bankers in Australia take advantage of this to become members. Welcome to you all down under. In the autumn of 2019, our Young Banker of the Year final was held at the Mansion House in the City of London, with Sarah Walker from Santander winning both the main prize and the audience prize that night. Now, Sarah's winning idea, My Debt Advisor, was an app that helps to improve people's lives by helping them reduce their debt quicker and minimize interest paid. It also demonstrated in a very practical way the social purpose of banking, helping to reconnect banks and society. Now this year, our Young Banker of the Year awards have been moved online, and we have recently held our virtual semi-finals. So congratulations to those who've made it through, and good luck for the final coming up in September. Through the work of the Chartered Body Alliance, with our counterparts at the Chartered Insurance Institutes and the Chartered Institutes for Securities and Investments, we have continued to raise the profile of chartered status to financial services professionals and other key stakeholders. The rising influence of the Alliance was demonstrated by all three chief executives sitting on Her Majesty's Treasury's Financial Services Skills Task Force, the FSST and the Financial Conduct Authority's Purpose in Financial Services Working Group. They've been doing that for the past year, and this culminated in the publishing of a final report by the FSST earlier this year and an FCA SE series on purpose, featuring both an alliance and a Chartered Banker Institute SE. Now, this alliance is crucial to our reach and impact with regulators and policymakers, evidenced by the considerable efforts of the Alliance to persuade and challenge the FCA on their plans for a new FCA directory of individuals. And partly thanks to our efforts, this will now include reference to our members, respective professional standing, and professional membership, a significant step forward in regulatory endorsement of professional status. To complement this, as part of our commitment to improving public trust, our institute launched a new register for banking professionals. The register has been designed to provide basic confirmation of the professional standing of institute members and whether they have an approved status, qualified retail or mortgage advice or whatever it may be, and that is hugely valuable to the public. Now, the service has been warmly welcomed by the FCA and we hope the public and members of the Institute will find it simple to use too. 
And so, in circular terms, I return again to where I started and how the coronavirus is still dominating the news agenda and is clearly set to do so for some time to come. These choppy waters are with us and uncertainty is all around for now. At some point, hopefully not before too long, our focus will shift to mitigating and recovering from the financial impacts of the pandemic. Banks and bankers are already playing and will play a key role alongside governments to help rebuild businesses, communities and personal finances. Our sector and our banking profession is ready to play its part and show how much we care for society. We are comprised of thoughtful, purposeful individuals and overwhelmingly the majority of them come from decent places and come to work every day wanting to support customers, their families and their businesses, whether we work at not-for-profit institutions or in the mutual sector. So it's vital that we as an institute support those engaged in this mammoth task. As with most things, like presidents of our institute, this moment will eventually pass and our professional team will take the necessary decisions to keep our people safe and provide for our members. Our institute has been through much and will deal with the current challenges just as our predecessors did. As you gather, I have a huge amount of respect for learning from the lessons of the past whilst dealing with the future. Now, Alan Turing, a well-known brain the size of the planet, said, we can only see a short distance ahead, but we can see plenty there that needs to be done. And finally, thank you to all our fellows and members who gave their time, expertise, and experience to support the Institute during the course of the last year. In particular, I pay tribute to my vice presidents and board members who have supported our efforts, to our executive team, and all of us throughout these challenging times. To three of our board members especially, Susan Younger, Brian McCrindle and Hugh Mackay, who agreed to stay on beyond their term of office, which would have normally concluded today, to help shepherd and steer the Institute through these choppy waters I've described. And I convey my special thanks to all three of them and hope that they can be released from their burdens soon. We'll say more about that during the course of the meeting today. Now, I hope that you are as proud of this old institute as I am to be president. My final words should be for the institute staff and our collective thanks to them for the significant effort they put into our institute every day. Now, to all of you tuning in, listening tonight, maybe watching, listening, and catch up, stay well and thank you. And before moving on to our formal agenda, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take those now. And I'll pause for a moment before we move on to the formal activity. There being no questions at this stage, uh, we will move to the formal part of the agenda. And just as a quick reminder, this is the running order, and we'll be moving on to the annual report. This should be appearing on your screen now. We should now consider the Institute's annual report for 2019-20. I have already touched upon many of the highlights of our year just passed in my address uh, a few moments ago. The full annual report, together with our annual accounts, is available to members on the Institute website. And indeed, many of you, if not all of you, have already read it and been through it. We've also added a copy of the report to the Bright Talk channel for you to view. The annual report was considered by the Audit and Risk Committee and by our Board of Trustees and is recommended by the Board of 
trustees for adoption. If you have any questions regarding the report, please put them now using the online Q&A facility. And I will pause for a few moments of silence whilst that is, uh, is going on. So I now propose the adoption of the annual reports and would ask those in favour and any opposed to vote accordingly. Please go ahead. Please continue to vote, and we shall move along very shortly. I can confirm that the annual report for 2019-20 is adopted. We have second matter of submission of the accounts for the same year to 29th February 2020 and auditor's report. So we should now consider that. Um, our auditor's report from Shane and Tate, as I mentioned a moment ago, the accounts are available to members via the Institute website and also on this uh, channel. As with our annual report, the accounts have been considered by the Audit and Risk Committee and the Board of Trustees and are recommended by the Board for adoption. If you have any questions, we can happily deal with those, but I would now suggest that we move to approve the accounts. Thank you very much indeed. I can confirm that the accounts and auditors report for the year to 29th February are adopted. Uh, item 5. The appointments of our auditor. We will now deal with that for the 2021-21 timeframe. The Audits and Risk Committee and the Board of Trustees propose the reappointment of Sheena Tate as auditor. Would those in favour and any opposed please vote accordingly. Thank you very much indeed, everyone. I confirm that Shane and Tate is reappointed as auditor for 2019-20. Sorry, 2021. In previous years, we have elected our office bearers, the president and vice presidents, annually with a long-standing tradition that they would serve in the post for two years. Last year, when we received our revised royal charter, this was formalised, so our office bearers were nominated and elected for a two-year term. There are therefore no elections this year, and I'm delighted to continue to serve as your president for a further 12 months. My colleagues Lynn Burns and Steve Pateman will continue to serve as our vice presidents next year. The Institute's rules also state that the board shall consist of up to 11 trustees who are members of the Institute plus two or more independent lay trustees. These trustees are recruited by open selection. There is a recruitment process overseen by the nomination committee which proposes institute members possessing the expertise, experience and skills required. And that nomination committee then seeks approval of its recommendations at the annual general meeting. Now trustees would normally hold office for three years and from the date of the annual general meeting approving their appointment and they are eligible for re-election for one further term. Trustees may be reappointed for a third term when this would enable them to assume the presidency or vice presidency or in other exceptional circumstances subject to the approval of the Non-Nations Committee and the AGM. 
Now, we had anticipated that three very long-serving trustees would step down from our board this evening. I alluded to them in my uh, address earlier. And that would be think, thanking them from our, on our behalf for their sterling service over many years within our institute. We had begun the process of recruiting new trustees and received more than 20 applications for three posts, including a number from our overseas members, which was heartening and really pleasing to see. In March 2020, however, the Board of Trustees considered that and decided that in light of the exceptional circumstances caused by the pandemic, recruitment of new trustees to join the Board at this AGM would be paused and reviewed later in the year. This was not felt to be an appropriate time to recruit, and new trustees would have been disadvantaged by being so. And the Board believes these have been truly exceptional circumstances. I'm very, therefore very grateful to my three colleagues who have agreed to extend their trusteeship until we can recruit and induct their replacements. So I mentioned earlier Susan Younger, Hugh Mackay, and Brian McCrindle. They chair our Quality and Standards Committee, our Nomination Committee, and Audit and Risk Committee, respectively. And the chairmanships of those particular committees are, are in transit right now with a handover being conducted, as those three individuals will be with us until we secure new trustees later in the year. Now, in order to ensure smooth succession, new chairs of those three committees have been identified and are, are, are moving along. At our board meeting earlier this afternoon, uh, we agreed to proceed with the recruitment of new trustees, so we've started that process again. And they will succeed to Susan, Hugh and Brian over the summer, with the aim of having them join the board in December. Ahead of that, we will need to call a short special general meeting to approve the appointments. And I suspect, given the pandemic and where we may be in the autumn time, it probably will be again on this sort of platform. So that is for information only, uh, and we will be recalling uh, you as a group for a special general meeting for those trustee appointments later in the year. There is no further formal business for the AGM brought to us by the Board of Trustees or the Institute Committees, and no additional items for discussion have been intimated by members in advance of our meeting. So I am happy to, in these rather trying and difficult circumstances, to give members the opportunity to raise any other matters they might wish to do so. So please use the Q&A um, position if uh, you would like to raise a question on Bright Talk. And uh, I'm happy to answer those, as will Simon Thompson, our Chief Executive. So I will pause for a moment or two and uh, bear with us as those who may have a question uh, are very, ha very happy to take those. And if there aren't, we will move on in about a moment's time. Uh, we should have some background music playing, but uh, and I won't do any stand-up humor or singing, I've promised. But we do not have any questions uh, from the floor. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and all of you. That concludes the business of the 145th Annual General Meeting of the Chartered Banker Institute. As your president, I look forward to a further year with Vice Presidents and Board to serving you for another year and reporting back to you at the same time next year, when I really do hope that once again some of us will be able to meet in person. And as many more of our international members will join us in electronic format. In the meantime, all that remains is for me to say, stay well, look after yourselves, and good night. <laughs>